All right, so um, I'm Nadia, product designer at Verify by Blastring, and meeting today with Eduardo, uh, an incubation engineer for MLOps. And we're going to talk about uh, the work that he's been doing around um, using pipelines for MLOps. So um, I prepared some questions. I see that you've already added some answers, but um, just to start with, maybe you can just provide some background for the work that you've been doing. What are your main goals and what are the things that you're looking into? Yeah, sure. So uh, I'm an incubation engineer, meaning uh, I work on things across the entire uh, GitLab stack and the envelope stage will work the same, uh, or working across the stack. And one of the places I'm working now is with pipelines. Um, on my incubation engineering, my vision is to make uh, GitLab a tool data scientists and machine learning engineers love to use. Uh, at this point, especially for data scientists, a tool they have to use, and there's not a lot of features targeted to them. It's a user base we already have, but we're, we never cared much about, or it was never in our focus. And my mission is to find places and low hanging fruits within uh, the within our stack where I can create a delightful experience for them. Yeah, and um, one of these is great. pipelines. <laughs> yeah, so the data scientist persona is very new to me. Um, usually when designing for pipeline authoring, we're thinking about developers, DevOps engineers, and uh, really, it was the first time that I thought about a data scientist as a persona for GitLab pipelines when, when you started sharing your updates. So I'm really curious to learn a bit more about what you know so far, what you've learned so far about this persona and how their needs differ from an engineer using pipelines. Yeah, so on this, I always talk about two different groups one is a machine learning engineer and the second is data science the machine learning engineers uh, is more a classical software engineer specialized in machine learning so that is easier a little bit to to wrap around um, our heads around the data scientist however is a, it's a very different persona because um while of course there are some that come from software engineering the group is really diverse. So when I was at a scientist, I had friends that came from psychology, from chemistry, from uh, physics, from, I don't know, anywhere. Um, people had that come from academia into, uh, into the industry because they know how to deal with data. Um, so they usually have masters, at least. They often, more often than not, have PhDs. So they're very smart. Uh, they, have, they are very uh, educated people. Um, but their focus is dealing with the data, not, and they were never trained on coding or making scalable software or things like that. So their, their, their mindset is a lot in one-offs, the same way that they do um, papers or research is like, okay, I'm gonna write this paper. I don't need to care so much about this, the, 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 the scalability of my work. I don't need to care so much about the, uh, maintainability of mode because it's meant for that for that group and it's not going to be used by a lot of people in the end, right? So how they use GitLab is a bit different in this world because um, it's a lot, of course they're, they're the ones that make the machine more models, but the analysis itself they are one-offs. Uh, you create the the, the 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 analysis, you finish the, the analysis. It's usually a Jupyter notebook, a markdown that you end up writing a Google Docs for your stakeholders with the main findings. Uh, and then you have the machine learning models, but the code is small in general, and it doesn't interact with the main code base more often than not. Uh, so it doesn't have the same benefit. GitLab doesn't offer the same benefits with code reviews, with uh, CI, CD, uh, at least not the way uh, in its current incarnation. You mentioned Juniper notebooks. Can you talk a bit more about that? Mm -hmm. Like what do they use it for and what is it? Yeah, so Jupyter Notebook is uh, an interactive uh, coding environment. It's used a lot by on, on teaching data science because data science is a very visual uh, 
thing. So you create, you, you need the plots, you need to see the data, you need to plot the data, understand the data more often than not. And Jupyter Notebooks bring this in into the same environment. You can, you can have the markdown, you can have the code, and you can have the outputs, the images rendered in the same place. This makes, this, this makes it very, uh, uh, it's really good to use to create the thing, the, the, your, your analysis and your models, because it's very interactive. You can go back and forth, uh, shared state is the same. Um, but the file itself, it's not really a binary, it's a JSON file that has both input and output into it. So for tooling, it makes it very challenging. It's really hard, for example, most of it is done in Python uh, with a lot of folks also using uh, R uh, for this. But on the, on the, it's very hard, for example, to run a um, linter, uh, for example, or a formatter, or code review is, uh, added. if without an additional tooling on top of it, it's pretty much impossible to do because it's like a, this 10, 20,000 line uh, JSON file with images in the middle of it as base 64. Um, and this is one of the challenges that we're tackling over here in Active Club, uh, how to make that possible. But the other thing is that, okay, the data scientists usually use Jupyter notebooks, but the Jupyter notebooks, as I mentioned, they cannot be used uh, or there is not enough support for it to be used on the production environment. So if they, they, they create a mod or something, somebody is gonna have to translate into a uh, module or something that can be imported or uh, from the main code base. That's where most times machine learning engineer comes in. Um, and yeah, so it's just that, that's the general gist of the Jupyter Notebook and why it's important. It's just making the, the job so much easier than just running on the, on the scripts. Yeah, makes sense. And how do they, like, how do data scientists use pipelines for their work and what does it mm. help them accomplish? That's the, that's where, child, the, the, where the, the fun part comes in. So when you create a model or any, or, or a, you need data and the data often does not you are not allowed to have this data on your computer uh, because privacy and shenanigans or sometimes it just doesn't fit your your uh your computer it's like terabytes of data um additionally training a model takes a lot of resources um sometimes well the examples that i shared earlier uh, on a previous uh, presentation were took one minute to train a model but it's not uncommon for a model to take a full day for training or two days or three days for training or even a month for training sometimes um so when you are prototyping the code your model we are you already depend on the pipelines for running your model because your your code is going to already be executing on the cloud either way right it's not going to run on your machine so the need for pipelines happen very early. Um, by the moment you start coding, by the moment you start your Jupyter Notebook, you're already thinking, okay, I might need a pipeline over here. The Jupyter Notebooks usually already run on, a, on some cloud, some uh, provider uh, that you can connect to these pipelines uh, in an easier way. But you already, instead of like on the regular DevOps uh, lifecycle where the pipelines happen after you do the first commit, or for the scientists, they happen a lot before your first commit. Uh, you don't even know if that code makes sense yet. You don't even, you're just testing out things and you're iterating very fast, changing the code here and there, changing, changing, changing. And all of this already benefits from running on the pipeline in the first place, right? And a big pain point within GitLab is that it depends on this cycle of, okay, change, commit, open the UI, take a look because it takes long sometimes an hour or two before the pipeline and then you realize okay there was a mistake now go back go back and the cycle takes a lot of time yeah and um what would be uh, the alternative experience like i'm sure you're thinking about some things that um mm -hmm. Could be useful um, some some features or some some changes to how pipelines work that could be useful to the data scientist based on this workflow that you described. Yeah. So the first of all, the first of them, the UI 
for pipelines, uh, GitLab is one of the best in the market. Uh, when you compare all of the, the different uh, providers, the other users like Kubeflow uh, pipelines, like uh, Argo, like uh, what not, what's the name of the other, Airflow, Luigi, there are plenty of them that are used for the data science pipelines, AWS SageMaker, um, the, uh, what's the GCP Composer uh, is the one, but it's also Airflow, the GCP Composer. So, know. so the UI at GitLab is really good. It makes it really easy to look at things and um, the dynamic, uh, I've been using a lot of the dynamic parent-child pipeline for this, for my use case, because, well, I can do whatever I want. I don't need to depend on like on things that are at the repository, I can make my own. So I've been using that a lot. But the alternative experience that I want, that I want to add on top of this that GitLab already provides is the ability to run pipelines without depending on GitFlow itself. So I am at my remote machine coding. I want to just click a button on Jupyter Lab, which is the IDE for Jupyter, or just on my uh, on my terminal and say, okay, GitLab, run this. YAML, run this Jupyter Notebook, run this Python file, run this configuration as a pipeline. It, throw, it gets me a uh, an idea of a pipeline that is running or already opens the pipeline on a different page without the, so that I can take a look. This is the first. The second one is uh, checkpoints uh, because usually there's a lot of steps into machine learning training model or whatnot. And for example, you, you fetch the data, you train, uh, you split the data, you train the data, you test the data and you upload to your uh, model slash image registry or, or whatever. And if it fails for some reason and you're iterating at the, I don't know, testing the model, the biggest part of the work was already done. Uh, I just want to iterate on that small step in the end. And having for that step, being having to iterate on everything again that's a lot of time wasted especially that I, i'm not going to have to do this once right if there's a problem we're going to have to do run two or three or four times until i get it uh, right and this can re easily uh, couple up the full day so if i could have a way where i can run only from that step forward like for step six using the state of a, of a previous run pipeline up until state four until, up until step four that would be great. And I don't think that's only data scientists that want it. Uh, I think this is a general uh, use case uh, that is both of them, actually, even the first one that I mentioned, running without the opinion git flow, just while iterating the, the YAML file, but especially for data scientists, just because of the nature of the of the, the pipelines and how long they take to run and how long they take to get and how important they are on the, on the data science workflow, these problems are exacerbated. Uh, you really feel everyone is through the pain, but as a scientist feels it more often on this regards. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, it's definitely something that I've heard from um, just engineers, DevOps engineers who author pipeline configuration. It's definitely a big pain when you're iterating on a big pipeline configuration and they do want to do this kind of granular testing. So if you know a piece of your pipeline works, you don't want to have to rerun it every single time when you're iterating on some other part. So yeah, it's a really good point. Um, so what are some of the problems that you're currently focusing on? What is your like main focus? Yeah, <laughs> yeah I have ADHD and I don't have something called as main focus. <laughs> <laughs> um, there are four problems I'm working on. Um, First, that it's really the one that I'll be spending most of my time right now is Jupyter uh, Notebooks uh, code reviews. So make it easier for data scientists to run code reviews on on, 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 on GitLab. And this has been uh, has this has been received a great uh, feedback from from users, and it's really cool. Second, pipelines. Um, so I started last few months with just an exploration of how pipelines work using a data science. Uh, application, which is hyperparameter optimization. There's uh, a thread on it uh, that I created. Uh, and I want to expand on that. Uh, without, I have uh, some ideas to do that without really changing the code base, just using what's in there and, and hacking my way through it. Um, 
The third one, uh, user personas, uh, and not really user personas, but the, but the problem is it's creating awareness of the data science uh, use cases within GitLab. Uh, this is one of the, the things that I, I really want to put uh, focus on uh, on the next few months because we have a lot of smart people, but and they are creating uh, great products, but the data science was never a focus of these people. They, most of them don't even know that the data scientists use GitLab in itself. They don't know the difference. And uh, I see myself on my role beyond just implementing features as an advocate uh, for data scientists within uh, GitLab. So I've been working a bit on this, uh, you know, how to uh, on, on evangelizing the word of data science within mm -hmm. GitLab. Um, and the fourth, that is a little bit uh, on the horizon, not yet right now, but it's something that I call the analytics repository, which is a wiki for uh, specialized for data science uh, within GitLab. That if, uh, that's something that uh, it's on my mind as well. Those are the four things that I want to look at in the near future. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there anything that um, we can help you with? Um, by we, I mean product designers and UX researchers. I know that you're already getting some help from UX research. Um, yeah, and since pipeline authoring is so close to kind of the things that you're looking into and we do have lots of overlapping interest. I wanna see how we can help you if possible, or at least how we can make sure that we're, we're staying aligned as we're moving forward with some of the things that we're working on and the things that you're doing. Yeah, so the best way I think, it's hard to say work together at this point uh, because it's just so, exploratory and you already have like all of the teams already have so much on their plates and uh, I don't want to push this this case but the best thing that uh, anyone can do is just keep uh, keep up with each other's uh, updates so both me looking at what's going on on pipelines but I also release my updates every uh, I won't say weekly but it's fortnightly it's yeah whenever I remember to release but it's with a certain cadence um, and on there, I, I try at least a while to share with uh, the, the specific groups that might be interested in that specific, because sometimes some weeks I'm working entirely on code review. Some weeks I'm working entirely on, on pipeline authoring. Some weeks I just work doing PM work or uh, upkeep or something like that. So not often it's necess unnecessary. So, but I, I tend to try to share uh, and I really, really appreciate feedback on those. And because I don't want to create a product or a feature that we see two months down the road, uh, okay, that, that's not applicable. Uh, it's just impossible to implement this within uh, the current setup. So, and feedback in general. So ideas, often I try to create something uh, and then a month I had somebody point me to a created issue that already had some of those that could be help me guide my way or avoid some uh, early problems that would be really helpful as well. Yeah, makes sense. Um, yeah, your updates have been very, very helpful. I really appreciate those. And it's always inspiring to see this exploration um, because it's something that we don't, don't have the bandwidth to do as much, you know, <laughs> this kind of experimentation. So it's really inspiring to see. Um, yeah, I don't have any other questions. I think it was a really good overview of what you're working on and um, I'll keep an eye out for your updates. Uh, but yeah, let me know if you have any questions, if there's anything I can help you with. Um, I'd be happy to point you to some resources or connect you with the right people or whatnot. Feel free to reach out anytime. Okay, cool. Uh, I will. Thanks for having this chat with me. Awesome. Thank you, Eduardo. Have a good day. Bye. Thank you.